So hello everybody, um, welcome to this session about exploring careers in libraries today. Um, my name is Emma Sullivan, I'm the Staff Development Librarian here at the Bodleian Libraries. Um, just some housekeeping before we sort of get started. Um, we are recording this session um, and if you require captions you can use the, the menu at the top of your screen um, with the three dots there um, to switch on captions. Um, today we have got uh, Abby and Ellie who are helping us with the slides and we've got Natasha who will be monitoring the Q&A um, as we go along. So do make use of that facility. Um, there's the Q&A there that you can use. Uh, you can say hi on there, but also if you've got any questions during the session, um, do, uh, do add those in and Natasha and others will try and answer those as we go along. OK, so um, the session today is really to give you an understanding of careers in libraries and the sorts of jobs that you could do in a library. Um, as I mentioned in the advert, people think that libraries are all about books. Um, and although this is true, library work is very much about connecting information and people. Um, and whilst books form a ma major part of our, our collections, uh, what a, lot, a lot of what we do is actually around digital uh, and uh, digital resources. OK, um, next slide, please, Abby. So just to give you the outline for today, um, I'm going to talk during this first section about careers in libraries. Then we're going to hear from some of our trainees. So we have got um, Rose Zhang, who is the trainee at the Union. We have also got Jenna Illett, who is the trainee at the Sackler Library. We have got um, Alice Zamboni, who is our digital archives trainee. And then what we will do is have a little break um, uh, between this section and the next section. Um, and after our break, we're going to hear from uh, Jasdeep Singh, who leads our We Are Our History project. We'll also hear from Judith Seifring, who is our head of digital collections discovery, and she's going to be talking about careers in digital libraries. Oliver House, who is the superintendent for the special collections reading room, will talk about reader services. And then we've got Manti Sunaduna, who is our head of East Asia section and HD Chung Chinese Studies Librarian, and he's going to talk about collections. OK, so uh, next slide, please, Abby. So um, there are a number of um, careers that fit under the information professions. So obviously we've got libraries, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I won't dwell too much on that now because we're going to hear about that this morning. Um, but just to say there's all sorts of libraries that you can work in and all sorts of roles that you can do and we will touch on those in this session. Knowledge management is about capturing um, and sharing and effectively utilising the knowledge within an organisation um, and that might focus on existing knowledge, it might be new knowledge that comes into the organisation and uh, roles in knowledge management are really around retention and storage of knowledge in organisations. Information management involves handling information from when it's collected or created by an organisation to when it's um, archived or deleted. And again, that includes the storage, uh, retrieval, access and use of this information. Data science is about turning machine or computer generated data into useful and usable information and it involves organising and categorising information and understanding how end users search for information. And then there's archives and records management, which is often seen as the same thing as library work and archives and libraries do work closely together. So we have archives within the Bodleian libraries, um, but it's actually uh, archives and records management are related professions and they have, uh, they are sort of separate. They have their own professional body. Um, and working with archives involves acquiring, managing, conserving and maintaining historical materials. And records managers help manage an organisation's records. So they will work on things like retention policies and when information gets destroyed, how it's kept uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and information about all these strands of the information professions uh, can be found on the SILIP website. So SILIP stands for the Chartered Institute for Library and Information Professionals. It's our professional body 
and um, I'm going to ask Natasha to drop some uh, links into the chat as we go into the Q&A as we go and um, you will be able to pick those up and we can circulate them after this event as well. OK, next slide, please, Abby. So there are lots of different libraries that you could end up working in and I've added a few to this slide here. Um, further and higher education. So this is where the Bodleian Libraries fits um, and where um, we all work. And um, working in a higher education library is really about supporting students, researchers and academics to access the information they need for their studies and also um, about supporting them in the information they skills that they need um, to do their research and uh, in, with, with their with their studies too. Public libraries is about working with a wide range of people uh, and that might include, <coughs> excuse me, supporting reading literacy. It might be about providing events. It might be um, about supporting people with their digital skills and public libraries are very much community focused um, and it's about serving the community and uh, and, and uh, supporting them with, with information. School libraries, again, this is about supporting reading and reader development um, for pupils in schools, as well as um, helping them with information literacy skills. So um, information literacy is around being able to search uh, for information, but also being able to evaluate the information that you find uh, to make sure that it's relevant and credible information. Prison libraries are part of running, uh, you know, part of a prison service and uh, about providing a safe and neutral environment for prisoners. Uh, it's about providing recreational reading, educational resources. Healthcare libraries really focus on providing information and knowledge to enable evidence based decision making, which is really key in the health sector. Within government libraries, you might be working with MPs, civil servants, government personnel to provide information for briefings, research, confidential inquiries, that sort of thing. And then legal libraries is quite another big sector within libraries and um, they focus on law. Obviously, um, there might be um, it might be a legal library or a law library within an academic setting. So here at the Bodleian, we have the Bodleian Law Library or it might be a library within a law firm. <clears throat> And uh, within that role, you would be supporting research inquiries, delivering training and um, sort of developing or, or gathering current awareness for legal and regulatory changes uh, within the law. Next slide, please, Abby. So um, this slide just really shows the types of roles that you can do in libraries. And this shows a very traditional progression um, from starting out at an entry level, which is a graduate trainee post or a library assistant post, right to through a librarian who is someone who is likely to have a library qualification. They are likely to manage a library or libraries and manage the staff that are in that to manage the whole service. Um, salary wise, um, and these are some figures from 2019, so they are a little bit out of date, but uh, as a library assistant, you are looking at around 22,000 average per annum, going up to about 60,000 as a librarian um, within an academic setting. And again, those salaries are available on the uh, CILIP website, so we can send you the link to those and you can, you can have a browse of those. Um, next slide, please, Abby. This slide sort of shows some of the more specialist roles that you could do in a library. Um, so these are the sort of roles you might do once you've gained a library qualification. I'll just run through, uh, run through them and explain what they are. So as a systems librarian, you'll be looking after what we call the library management system. You probably know it as the library catalogue, but it's, it's the, 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 the database that you search to find books when you visit a library. Um, it involves configuring um, and maintaining the catalogue in a role like this maybe developing the front end of the catalogue, so there's the side that the users see doing user testing and things like that, and also data reporting. The next one on the list is a cataloguer. This involves, um, this role involves cataloguing resources. They might be print resources, they might be digital resources, but you would be using specific standards to assign terms to resources to enable people to find the information they need. So that is, one example of that is when you go in and um, search for a book, it's the keywords that you're looking for. Those will have been assigned by a cataloger. 
Subject specialists work within subject specific collections and support library users who are studying and researching in those subject areas. A reader service librarian <clears throat> works closely with readers and managing the reader facing part of the library. And we'll hear from Oliver later on. Uh, he'll be talking about his role. And then we've got special collections librarian. Again, this is working with special collections, but there is more focus on conservation, digitization of, of um, the resources to enable preservation and also to enable access. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's not possible to, um, to look at the material because it needs to be preserved and looked after. So digitizing it is one way to provide a, a wide, you know, wider access for people. And also exhibitions are linked very closely often to special collections because they are unique items that we, we hold. Uh, and just to say there are lots of different job titles out there. So if you go online looking for library jobs, um, that might be quite handy to see the different roles that are available and the different skills that are required. Next slide, please, Abby. So this is some of the skills that you would need for working in libraries. So this slide sort of looks at the generic skills. Um, so we have got things in there like uh, an interest in, in libraries, obviously, that's really handy. Um, a real focus on customer service and uh, those sort of skills, so working with readers, communication skills. Um, also things, more generic things like time management and project management. Um, so those, those are the sorts of skills that you will need generally for working in libraries. Next slide, please, Abby. And then the next slide sort of shows some of the more specialist skills that you might need. So searching skills. So this is the ability to be able to search databases using specific search terms and filters um, and understanding the best database for that task as well, or the best um, electronic resource for the task. Again, cataloging is about assigning relevant terms to resources um, and enabling um, them to be accessible to, to library readers. Collections management, the skills there are all around the life cycle of the, the collection. So being able to buy the right relevant books for readers right through to understanding when books need to be withdrawn. Library technologies are really key. And as I said on the previous slide, digital skills are really, really important at the moment. Um, we're sort of seeing people uh, within research, certainly uh, the way they are researching information is changing uh, due to um, open access and open resources. So yeah, it's about uh, having skills in certain systems around databases and the library catalogue. I've listed regulations there because um, working within libraries, you need to have a good awareness of GDPR, so that's data protection, copyright as well, understanding how much people can copy from resources, IP, licensing, so there's, there's other things as well, but that is a big part of, of the library profession. Often within academic libraries, we do quite a lot of teaching. So that's around delivering information sessions. So helping people to understand how to search databases. It might be a session on plagiarism or just searching the library catalogue. Um, so those are the sorts of teaching skills, training sessions that, that we run here at the Bodleian. Specialist advice, again, advising readers on how to search the catalogue maybe advising readers on how to deposit their, their research outputs within our database. So here at the Bodleian, we have the Oxford Research Archive, and that's where we encourage our researchers to deposit uh, their data and, and the research that they've been doing to make it accessible to others. Curation and preservation. So this is book repair. Um, and this can be quite basic things in, in, in a library where they have a lot of undergraduate texts. It's just about keeping the books uh, in circulation by repairing them through to really, really specialist skills. Um, and we have a team here at the Bodleian who work with rare manuscripts uh, and other rare items and, and have real specialist skills in fixing those books. Data skills are important, so understanding data. It might be around looking at our library statistics and looking at who's visiting the library and how we use those statistics to then promote certain services. And at the end there, I've got advocacy and promotion. Um, it's really key in this day and age that we really demonstrate our value. Um, SILIP uh, is involved with lobbying government on library and information issues. And it's really important that we as library staff and our skills are, are seen uh, and, and valued. Next slide, please, Abby. So here are some of the, the hot topics that are um, 
that are key in libraries at the moment. Um, support for public libraries, that's around advocating their importance. You're probably all aware that um, in recent years, public libraries have been closing, which is a real shame, um, but they are a real community uh, hub and a support network for all sorts of different people. And with the recent um, issues with cost of living, they're seen as warm spaces now. So, um, you know, libraries, public libraries are, are really valuable and it's important to, to support those. Sustainable libraries, so again, that's around looking at our spaces, seeing if we can reduce our carbon footprint, and this is something that we're all conscious of at the moment. Facts Matter was a campaign that Philip ran recently, <clears throat> and that's around the fact that we live in an age of disinformation, and it's really about how libraries can ensure that the information people seek um, is accurate and reliable. Uh, again, I've listed evidence based decision making uh, and that's key for the, the health um, librarians at the moment. And it's also key as well for the general uh, general public to access reliable health information. Um, digital skills important for all of us and how do we support that digital literacy for our readers, but also for our staff. EDI is a really big topic at the moment and it is particularly so since uh, the Black Lives Matter campaign. And it does touch everything that we do and Jasdi will, will speak about that later on. Um, but really it's about thinking about whether, you know, you know, how we how we catalogue our resources, the language that we're using, are our collections inclusive? Do we have a diverse uh, range of staff working for us? It's those sort of topics. Open scholarship is a, is, is key at the moment um, and we really need to think about how we support our researchers when they are researching using open data and open educational resources. Um, so yeah, so that's that's another another key issue around how knowledge is created and shared on a research level. OK, next slide, please, Abby. So um, I'm just going to um, talk about uh, different en entry level routes into the, to the profession if you want a career in libraries. Um, next slide, please, Abby. So um, library assistant. So this is quite, uh, you know, this is a role that you can get if you want to start working in libraries. It really does revolve around working with readers at the issue desk. Um, also around processing resources, so that might be finding missing books, adding to reading lists. Um, it might be about promoting the library through social media and other channels. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this role because we're going to hear from our trainees in a moment and they'll be able to give you more detail on that. Next slide, please, Abby. And talking of our graduate trainees, here's our lovely trainees from this year. Um, they're with us now at the moment, uh, doing their year with us. Um, this is similar, so a graduate trainee role is similar to a library assistant role. Uh, the graduate trainee scheme is a national scheme and various libraries across the country offer trainee posts. They're aimed at graduates who want to experience a year working in a library before potentially continuing that career and maybe moving on to get a library qualification. Um, so we offer a number of posts here at the Bodleian and we are advertising at the moment. We are currently recruiting. So if you've enjoyed this talk today, if you're keen to get into libraries, do have a look. We will post the link for that. Um, we have a close date of midday on the 23rd of January. So um, it isn't long now before the close date, but obviously do, do have a look at that link if you're interested and we would really welcome your applications. Um, our, our, our scheme comes with bespoke training, which um, Ellie, my colleague, helps to organise and does a brilliant job of that. Um, and it's just a great way of finding out about libraries and what it's all about. Uh, and it also gives the, you the experience you need to go on and do um, a library qualification afterwards. Next slide, please, Abby. So, um, there are library and information qualifications that you can study um, to progress your career. Um, so you can work in libraries as a library assistant or as a graduate trainee, and there are other roles that you can do without necessarily having a qualification. However, if you want to progress to higher grade roles, um, say, you know, a subject specialist or a deputy librarian, for example, uh, or do a more specialist role like a cataloguing uh, or um, a reader services librarian, then you may need to have a qualification and they will ask for this in the job specification. Uh, 
the body and libraries is a big organisation, so we have around 720 staff working for us. So we do have people working in our libraries that don't have the qualification. Um, and Judith will talk to you about that. So Judith looks after, is going to talk about digital libraries. And um, I'm pretty sure that the people in her team do not require the qualification. So, you know, the, getting the qualification isn't the be all and end all. There are other jobs that you can do within libraries. Next slide, please, Abby. So, as I mentioned, SILIC before, um, the Chartered Institute for Library and Information Professionals, um, it's our professional body, it's a membership body, and its purpose is to unite, support and empower information professionals across all sectors. They produce what's called the Professional Knowledge and Skills Base, that's what PKSB stands for, um, and this is the core knowledge and skills of the profession. Uh, and, and what you need as an information professional. So we've got things listed there that I've already mentioned, like collections management, like information governance, and at the bottom there, you've got things like the customer service skills, the IT skills, and right in the middle is our ethics and values. Um, and uh, SILIP so use this professional knowledge and skills base to accredit um, library degrees. Next slide, please, Abby. So a few places offer undergraduate degrees, Aberystwyth is one of those, but most offer a postgraduate degree in library and information studies. And this is what you may need to get if you want a higher grade job or a more specialist role in libraries. Most offer full time, which is one year, part time courses, which is two to three years, and some of them offer distance learning. And the courses will cover um, everything that's listed in that PKSB and would qualify you to get higher grade roles um, within, within library services. Next slide, please, Abby. So we realise that this is quite a narrow route to sort of to get into libraries and what we have done in recent years is develop some apprenticeship standards which gives another route into libraries for people. Um, so there's a couple that are available um, there is the, the level three standard which is for the role of library information and archive services assistant. Again this is an entry level apprenticeship and libraries may recruit an apprentice you don't have any prior knowledge you don't need any prior knowledge to become an apprentice. Um, but you can also use this standard if you're already working in libraries as a library assistant to gain a qualification for your role. We're also developing a level seven apprenticeship, uh, which is going to be at master's level. And this has just got through the proposal stage. Um, we, um, we are now looking at the knowledge and skills and behaviours that are linked to that role, which is a library information and knowledge professional. Um, and there's other apprenticeships as well, like customer service, management and leadership apprenticeships, which might be relevant to roles. Um, so, yeah, the good thing about the apprenticeships is the fact that the training is paid from the apprenticeship levy. So um, we are hoping once we get the level seven standard developed, that people will be able to do that and the training will be paid from the levy and you will have a master's level qualification um, in, in libraries in information studies. So professional registration. Um, next slide, please, Abby. Um, this is just something else to flag that's offered by SILIP. Um, it's about demonstrating your um, abilities, knowledge and experience. It doesn't replace a library qualification, but it's just something to be aware of. So certification is something that can be done um, if you're just starting out in your career. Chartership is for somebody who's been working for a number of years in the profession. And then fellowship is really for people who've been in the profession for a substantial amount of time and they are contributing to the profession. So as, as I said, it doesn't replace the qualification, but, but people do like to, to do these professional qualifications that are offered by SILIP just to keep their, their skills and their knowledge up to date. Next slide, please, Abby. So um, here's just some uh, examples of career paths. So um, this is sort of a traditional route that some of our tra trainees end up doing. So they have an undergraduate degree and it doesn't matter what that undergraduate degree is. They might get a graduate trainee post with us. Um, and then they might decide to go on and do a library and information studies master's degree and then get a, another role after that. So assistant librarian, maybe going on to become a subject consultant. And next slide, please, um, Abby. And this is just another route showing how you can use apprenticeships to get go through the profession, go or have a career in libraries. So we've got the library assistant role there. Um, so that might be recruiting a level three apprentice to that role. 
um, then they might get another role as a senior library assistant. They might de decide to do chartership with SILIP um, and then they go on to become a deputy librarian. And at that level, the level seven apprenticeship would be a valid qualification if they wanted to get that or they could do the masters. Um, so those are just some example career paths um, and obviously everyone finds their own route through 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 their library career. But but just to give you some some idea of what you could do. And I think the next slide is my last slide, Abby, before I hand on to our trainees. So this is um, just something to make you aware of. If after this event you're still keen on libraries, um, my colleague Andrew Grave at SILIP has highlighted a session that they're running around career tales and in-demand jobs. Um, you can see it's on the 31st of January there. He has said that he's happy to give complimentary places to people on this call, on this session. So if you are keen to join that, do email Andrew at the address on the slide and we can circulate it afterwards and he will make sure you're signed up for that session as well if you're interested in that. OK, that was all I had to say for my bit. Obviously, you've, I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope it's been useful. If you've got any questions, do do add them and we will answer those as we go along. But for now, I am going to hand over to um, Rose, I do believe, our training Rose um, for her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, so I am the graduate trainee at the Oxford Union Library. My name is Rose and I'll just talk a little bit about what I do here and uh, what skills I have required in the past three months or so. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the Oxford Union Library is a bit different from the other Bodleian libraries in the sense that it is sort of an independent organization started by Oxford students. Um, so we have a lot of members not only current Oxford students, but also alums. So one of the good thing about this library is that the membership is for life and we have a lot of um, um, alum, Oxford alums from like decades ago and they're still using this library very frequently. And um, we are also open to Oxford Brook students and also some uh, people who live nearby, they can apply for membership. Um, I think that's quite nice because it sort of, it's kind of like a hybrid of an academic and a public library in the sense that I get to work with not only students and professors, but also um, community members. So we often have people um, from like the community neighborhood coming in for printing requests and you get to talk to them a little bit. It's really nice. Um, and it is op also open to visitors. Um, I think RATCAM, I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think RATCAM is the only one that's open to visitors, the library and the college libraries are not, most of them are not open to visitors, but the Oxford Union Library is, which means that we have a lot of tourists coming in um, to see our murals which is another special feature about the library. So we have these beautiful paintings on the wall done by um, a bunch of artists who later became famous, like William Morris and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So this picture here is one of their paintings um, on our library's wall. Uh, it's all about Arthurian legend. Um, so yeah, we do attract a lot of art historians who come to the library just to see the paintings. Um, and in terms of the collection, the library holds a very diverse range of collection from academic textbooks to um, contemporary popular fiction. There is one room devoted to uh, fictions. It's just like novels from um, early like uh, 19th century novels to contemporary novels and um, we also have our own stack rooms where we hold more like older books and archival materials 
which uh, are stored in the basement downstairs. And yeah, so that's a little bit about the library itself. Um, could we please go on to the next slide? Thank you. So as the graduate trainee here, I started in October and in the past three months, um, I've really learned a lot about many different aspects of librarianship. So um, I would say about 50% of my uh, duties focus on reader services, which means that for half of my time, I would be um, at the front desk um, answering reader inquiries, processing books, and also helping with the printing requests. Um, so I really enjoy doing that because, um, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of uh, alumni members who have been using this library for decades and you see them sort of every day and you get to develop a relationship with them, which is what I like about working in a library. And um, apart from reader services, I also work on some everyday tasks such as uh, shelving or um, shelf tidying, which basically means that um, checking all the books to make sure that they are shelved correctly and also opening and closing, which I think is um, really helpful. It's, re it's a really good practice because um, um, at first I was a bit nervous about closing the library by myself, um, but my colleagues were all very kind and helpful. Um, they gave me a lot of guidance. So then with time, I built up the confidence to close the library uh, in the evening. Sometimes, um, usually once one day every week, I would do the evening shift and close down everything by myself. Um, and yeah, also some other um, random tasks like creating posters, uh, which is kind of fun because um, I get to practice a little bit of graphic design skills, which I will talk a bit more later on. And another big part is processing new books because this library buys books every week. So pretty much every morning we would have deliveries of new books and then we go through sort of like a standard procedure to process these new books, label them and assign shelf marks, etc. Um, and also um, book displays. That's probably my favorite part of my duties, which is to put new books or not necessarily new books, like just books on this place based on particular themes. Since the Oxford Union hosts debate every Thursday, we do these sort of special displays for those debates related to the theme of the debate. Um, for example, the upcoming one this Thursday is about the future world being post-gender, so I am responsible for preparing sort of like a reading list for books on gender studies, which is what I'm working on right now. Um, and we also put rare books and special collections on displays. Um, yeah, so um, just to go through this list, we also um, work on digitization of previous um, term cards, which are basically like for each term, we have a schedule about what the debate is about every week and what speakers they're inviting. So um, some of these term cards are from 19... Uh, 60s or even earlier than that. So right now we're scanning all of them. And um, my one of the projects I worked on was creating a workflow for the scanning of the term cards using the scanner and some other softwares. And also social media. So as you can see here, uh, I do have a shameless plug for our Instagram, um, which I am managing right now. Uh, we post quite regularly about interesting facts about this particular library or libraries in general. So if you're interested, um, please you can feel free to follow our Instagram and also Facebook, etc. 
Um, and yeah, so another special thing about this library is that we do have a committee meeting every week, every Monday. Um, my role is the secretary of the meeting, so I take minutes about like what people say during meetings. It's usually about what books to buy and what books to get rid of because there are books that have been there for ages, but nobody really used them. So we're getting rid of some books every week. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And I'll go fast here. So for the skills I have required, I think one important skill is doing literature review, which is the fun part because it's sort of like intellectually stimulating. Um, for each reading list, I need to first do some research on all of the relevant books on this particular topic and then um, try to find the books that our library has and then put them, put them on display. Sometimes I also do literature research for readers. For example, if we have a student coming in asking if you have books on this particular author, then I would do some online research and send them the shelf marks or the online resources for that particular research topic they're working on. And another part is um, public writing. So basically, um, writing about something sort of academic, but in clear and concise language. Um, this is often relevant for social media posts and also book displays, because for the special collection display, I also need to write like a short paragraph, like an abstract, abstract about this book that I'm putting on display. And these two skills are something that I sort of already have by just being a student in the past, um, but the ones highlighted in red are things, skills that I acquired in the past three months, which I think are very valuable. And the first one, like I mentioned earlier, is graphic design. So I get to learn how to use Photoshop and other photo editing tools to make posters for the um, library. And also um, another one important one is supporting customer. So especially readers with disabilities, how to like make sure that the library is more accessible for them by, for example, getting like um, height adjustable tables, etc. And another one is minute taking. Um, it's relevant to my role as the secretary of the library committee. So often it's quite hard to write down everything everybody said, so I have to be quick and concise about it. And um, the last one, well, it's not really cataloging. It's more like classification, which means assigning shelf marks to books based on their subject. And um, we use the Dewey decimal system here, um, which is kind of similar to Library of Congress, but I think it's easier, like more simple than that. Um, so yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? I think it's the last one. OK, so just a little bit about how I got this rule. So um, my education was in uh, English and psychology for my undergrad and for my master's, I did comparative literature. So I always kind of knew that I wanted to do something related to books because that's my passion. Um, so while I was doing my undergrad and postgrad, I worked part time as sort of like a student library assistant at the uh, academic libraries at my university and um, for about three years, which I th think is very helpful for me to get this position because I have some sort of experience, but not much. Um, and in terms of the future, after this training year, I would like to get more library experience by working as a library assistant full time for one year before I do the master's in library studies. And eventually my goal is to become a subject librarian in English literature. And here is a link about uh, a four hour blog. So the trainees have this very nice blog that we post quite frequently about what it is like to 
be the trainee in this particular library. And right now we're doing a day in life posts, so you get to see um, all the different sort of experience at different libraries, which I think is really nice. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. I think we're handing over to Jenna. Yes, that yeah. sounds good. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to talk and assume that you can, so let me know if not. Um, so I'm Jenna. Um, if we just go to, yeah, perfect, that slide. Um, I'm the trainee at the Sackler Library, um, and I'm just going to talk to you quickly about my path into libraries, which is um, a little bit different. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so a bit of history about me is I did my degree in psychology, um, similar to Rose. Um, and that, I chose that course deliberately because I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, with my career. So it's a really great course to do um, because it gives you a lot of transferable skills. Um, and then after I graduated, um, obviously pandemic influenced a lot of things. So and I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I decided to um, go and work as an au pair in Switzerland for a bit um, to kind of improve my language skills because I studied German at school, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I was still really uncertain as to what I wanted to do. Um, and then randomly um, for Christmas, I was given a book about a bookshop. Um, and then I remembered that I really, really love books. And I started um, trying to research ways um, into working with them in some capacity. So I very much accidentally stumbled across um, the graduate trainee scheme. I think I found the job description for the previous years online somewhere um, and then waited for the, the new one to open up. Um, so although I use libraries a lot throughout my life, I'd never really considered working in them up until that point. So at that point, I was doing a lot of research into entry level positions um, and the graduate trainee scheme as well. So I was doing a lot of research about um, library roles while I was still in Switzerland, and I actually got the chance to visit the Stips Bibliothek in St. Gallen. Um, and those pictures on the slide are of that. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and that really inspired me as well to kind of um, keep striving towards this goal of working in libraries. So I was applying for the um, Oxford trainee scheme, um, including some of the colleges and some of the Cambridge colleges as well, because they also offer quite a few roles um, while applying for library jobs in the UK, just something to do in the meantime. Um, so it's important. Um, I wanted to note that I when I submitted my application to the scheme, I did not have any library experience. So that's definitely not something that should put you off from applying. Um, and once I'd submitted it, I did actually get a job working in a school library, which is very different. Um, I really enjoyed it. We kind of had a, a book group um, and then I was doing a lot of reorganising and creating a floor plan, floor plan and things like that. So that was um, quite different as well. Um, and then I interviewed for the trainee scheme online. Um, and again, like a lot of the questions that were asked, a lot of the examples I used were still from non-library work. Um, so it's definitely not something that should deter you. And then I was offered the job, which was great. Um, so the next slide, please. So a little bit more about the Sackler Library where I work. Um, so I'm the Sackler trainee, but my role is slightly different because um, there's also a trainee based at the Taylor Library, which is modern languages, and we tend to swap over quite a bit. And I also work at the NGL, which is the Nizami Ganjavi Library, um, which is for the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. So in a week, I can be at three different libraries, which is quite full on when you begin, um, but I really enjoy it because it kind of breaks up the week a little bit um, and all three of them are slightly different. So you get um, slightly different tasks to do, which is really fun. Um, the Sackler itself um, opened in 2001. Um, it houses quite a lot of different things. We've got classics, um, Egyptology, archaeology, um, art and art history. Um, so it's quite a um, large collection, which is why it's five floors. Um, and it's one of the principal research libraries of the Bodleian. Um, so it's quite an important library. We provide a lot of scans and things like that. Um, and we have quite a large collection of rare books and we have quite a few different rare books rooms kind of on the site, which is really interesting. Um, and we have quite a few of our own shelf mark systems as well, which is interesting to get to grips with. Um, but you do pick stuff up as you go. I was really intimidated when I first started, but um, slowly you, you do get to grips with it. Um, and if we go to the next and final slide, please. So I won't go into too much detail about this because a lot of this is quite similar to what Rose said. Um, a lot of the um, reader services um, is, is kind of the, the main um, my, the main part of my role. Um, so that's desk shifts, working with readers, helping to find missing things. 
Um, we also get a lot of interlibrary loans, which is when um, other libraries send us books because people can't find them in our collections. So we kind of have to make sure we don't lose those ones, especially. Um, we do a lot of providing scans, as I've said before, um, and we get deliveries and we process new books and that's a, pretty much a daily occurrence. So it's useful to keep on top of that. And then the other side to it is kind of like enhancing the library, um, which is just keeping things organized basically. And there's often, we have quite a lot of ongoing projects at the Sackler to um, weed out books. So that's things from the collections that we don't really use that much anymore. And we think it would make more sense to send them off site. Um, so we still retain them and people still have access to them, but it means we can make space for um, more important or newer material, which is really helpful. Um, and I also get involved with creating book displays. Um, the top picture is one that I did for um, to, about Tushan Carmen to kind of tie in with the um, centenary of the discovery of the tomb, which was um, really enjoyable for me because um, I'm really interested in Egyptology. Um, and then other things we do is like bibliographic checking. So that's seeing whether we have um, certain records, whether we have um, the books, if we have a physical copy, which library it's in to help um, with acquisitions. So the subject librarians know what to buy. Um, which is also really important. And then more specifically to do with the traineeship, we get the benefit of additional training sessions um, pretty much every week during term time, which is um, really fantastic. We've had a huge variety of things and it's been really eye opening to see different areas of, of librarianship. Um, as Rose mentioned, there is a blog. Um, both of us are involved on the blog team as well. So that's been really fun getting to write lots of things um, and it's just really enjoyable. And then the other thing that I'm also involved in um, is the Bodley and TikTok, which is um, just it's it's another avenue for us to kind of promote the work that we do and to try and make libraries a bit more accessible because a lot of people, I think, find them quite intim intimidating, especially some of the older sites like the old Bodleian. So we're kind of trying to encourage people to um, come to the library. So that's pretty much it. So I will hand over to the next person. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, yes, so that's me then. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. So my name is Alice and since April 2022, I've been the trainee digital archivist based at the Western Library, which you see here on the slide. But the next one would thank you. The next one now. So um, I'm enrolled in this um, archives traineeship, which has some similarities with the scheme you've just heard about from the library side, but also has some distinctive features. So my job goes on for two years and it already combines work with study. What I mean by that is that for the Bodleian, I am a member of staff uh, working in modern archives and manuscripts in special collections, but I'm simultaneously and automatically enrolled as a distance learning student in a postgraduate diploma course at the University of Aberystwyth with a focus on digital archives and preservation. Um, I would say the traineeship requires some, uh, let's say, time management and organization because I get one afternoon free off to study for my course every week, but I also need to put in extra hours of study outside of work. But I do like the way in which the work and the study complement each other. And of course, the Bodleian is actually funding my qualification, so I don't have to pay for it, which is great. Um, next slide, please. And also click again. I'm sorry for the hidden image. But so um, I wanted to ask why, why we why work with digital archives. And I think the answer to it is if I ask you to think about an archive, picture it in your mind right now. Uh, many people would think of, you know, lots of old dusty boxes filled with papers and lots and lots of documents and parchment. And this is true to an extent. But if I brought you downstairs right now uh, to look at the shelves which are pictured on the left, you will find that in those archival boxes, increasingly, we don't just have paper. We have lots and lots of um, electronic formats coming in the library. So an archive of email correspondence uh, or digital photographs, audio and video files instead of the old TypeScript speeches that you might have found some time ago. Um, so it is increasingly important for people coming into the archives profession right now to be just as competent working with born digital resources um, and to help curate and describe and preserve them for the future, working alongside the more traditional analog resources that archives have been uh, taken care of for quite a long time. So the idea of the traineeship is really to prepare me to work in the future with an increasingly hybrid library uh, collection. And the next slide, please. And um, I just wanted to give you some examples of what working with digital archives looks like. 
I'm extensively involved in the curation and collection management of the web archive at the Bodleian, which is a collection, a growing collection of archived websites. Um, I, for this, I picked up quite a lot of IT and technical skills. Um, I then learned some coding skills, particularly working with the XML in order to be able to transform into computer readable files those catalog descriptions from the university archives, which are still only uh, Word documents. So you encode that information into something that a computer can understand. And probably my favorite project right now has to do with uh, cataloging and describing the audiovisual collection from um, a former prime ministers of the UK. And this is to say that I'm also working with cataloging these quite new and unusual types of resources that are coming in the library more and more. Um, I would say uh, the aim of the traineeship is by the end of it, I will have a library, uh, sorry, an archives qualification, which is recognized by the Archives and Records Association in the UK and also two years worth of work experience, which hopefully will uh, allow me to apply for my first uh, job as a qualified archivist, working both, in, as I said, with in the realm of digital preservation, but also it has equipped me with the skills to work with traditional resources as well. Thank you. OK, brilliant. Thank you um, to Rose and Jenna um and Alice for those talks. Um, I think now it would be good if we should have a 10 minute break before we hear from our other speakers. So I'm suggesting that we come back here. Um, hello, sorry, I wasn't sure if people could hear me just then. I think my mic might have been muted. Anyway, what I was saying was thank you to Rose, Jenna um, and to Alice for those talks. And I was just going to suggest that we have a 10 minute break and we reconvene back in the meeting at five past 11 when we hear from our other speakers for the second part of the session. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome back to, to the second half of this session. Hope you've all managed to grab a, a cup of tea and have a stretch of your legs. Um, okay, so next up I think we've got um, Jasdi, who is going to talk about our We Are Our History project. OK, Jesse, if you're live, everyone should be able to hear you. Um, Jesse, your microphone's still on mute. As far as I can tell, I can't hear you, I'm afraid. Um, Jasdeep, should we, uh, Judith, I wonder if you could step in and, and do your slides next, just while Jasdeep has a chance to try and sort out his microphone. Would, would that be all right? Yes, no problem. OK, thank you. Um... Uh, everyone and um, so I'm Judith Seifring, I'm Head of Digital Collections Discovery um, at the Bodleian Libraries and I work for a department called Bodleian Digital Library Systems and Services. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what we do in the digital library and the kind of roles that we uh, offer and the sort of skills that you uh, would need to, to work for a digital library like ours which are a bit different from the kind of skills that, that Emma has been outlining earlier in the, in the talk. Um, next slide, please, Abby. So what do BDLSS, that's our snappy acronym, Bodily Digital Library Systems and Services. So what do we do? What do digital libraries typically do? Well, we manage and maintain library systems. So that can be um, all sorts of different systems related to, to library management, but also to library content. Uh, we have a large strand of work on digital preservation, which is around long term storage and preservation of digital outputs, making sure that they stay in good shape in the same way that we look after our physical collections. Uh, we have an infrastructure team who manage the systems, the servers, um, all of those things that, that underpin um, our uh, digital services. Uh, and the two um, remaining are the two teams that, that I manage, so digital collections, discovery and digital projects. So these tend to be focused on um, making our content discoverable online, ways to, to sort of um, engage and enhance um, our, our uh, resources. Um, and the digital collections discovery piece that, that I work on uh, mostly is mostly focused on kind of special collections and archival content. So not so much the, the, the standard print collections, but more the unique uh, and special stuff, if you like, uh, that the libraries hold. Next slide, please, Abby. So I'm just going to very quickly go through a few examples of the resources that BDLSS manage the systems for, and then I'll talk a bit in, in a bit more detail about the digital library. So the biggest one that you will probably recognise is our library catalogue that Emma mentioned earlier. So Solo, which is Search Oxford Libraries Online, um, but this system is also uh, underpinned by the library management system. So this is our print material, something like 13 million uh, volumes uh, are searchable on Solo. Next slide, please, Abby. Uh, we also maintain uh, and manage the Oxford University Research Archive, ORA, which is where all research conducted, at the, all the outputs of the research conducted at uh, the university is deposited. So that can be journal articles, conference papers, theses, all of that stuff. So we also have the development team who, who manage and, and develop that service. Next slide, please, Abby. Um, we also work with colleagues um, on manuscript catalogues, manuscript and archival catalogues. This is an example of one of our um, TEI catalogues. So we have eight of these and two more in development. 
CEI stands for Text Encoding Initiative, and we use the manuscript description module of that uh, to, to describe and encode our uh, records for manuscripts. This example is Firist, which is uh, actually a union catalogue of manuscripts from the Islamic world. Um, while most of our TEI catalogues just relate to li Bodleian Library collections, this one is a union catalogue. So as you'll see there, it brings together uh, collections from uh, around the UK, including uh, Cambridge, British Library, um, and, and we provide this interface and, and the systems which underpin it. Next slide, please, Abby. In addition to uh, cataloging resources, we also have some specialist uh, resources based on particular types of material. So this is an example of one that we managed, which is focused on uh, the work of William Henry Fox Talbot, who was pioneer of photography. Um, and this is uh, Catalogue Raisonne, which is bringing together uh, images and data related to Talbot archives held all around the world. So we have the uh, working with partners and to deliver this focused resource uh, on Fox Talbot. Um, next slide, please, Abby. We also um, deliver Electronic Enlightenment, which is a uh, specialist research resource uh, that we de uh, deliver in partnership with Oxford University Press. It's actually a subscription resource, but as Oxford um, Various institutions pay, pay a subscription to access it, and this is textual content related to Enlightenment letters. Next slide, please, Abby. And my final example before I get into more of the detail is uh, the biggest of the resources that my team manages, uh, which is Digital Bodleian. So when people think about what a digital library is, this is kind of what they think of. So this is our platform for digitised collections where you can go in, you can look at individual collections, you can search across materials. We have about 1.3 million images in Digital Bodleian uh, and we are stepping up our digitization efforts to get as much material online as we possibly can. So this will be a, a major focus for us over the next uh, 10 years or so. And um, so when, when people think about digital libraries, this is what they think of, but digital libraries are much bigger than this and, and they sort of uh, maintain and develop lots of different types of resources. Next slide, please, Abby. So why does the digital library matter? So as I've shown a sort of a, a small number of the resources that we manage and develop, and we do that to support the research and teaching of the university. So we're enabling access to collections, we're enabling access to content related to collections, um, and we support the university's research archives. So we're very much focused on being a support to the research and teaching activities of the university and to other universities as well, you know, other, other um, aspects of the research system in the UK and beyond. We also support the system that enables all of the physical libraries to function, the library management system, which underpins the catalogue. Um, so that's about, you know, if we didn't maintain that uh, resource and work on developing it, um, we the libraries wouldn't function, we wouldn't be, a, be able to record the acquisition of books, we wouldn't be able to circulate them and so on. In addition to that, the kind of content that we're delivering in the digital library is providing that content for other departments within the library, notably communications, publishing, public engagements. They are able to take that content and use it for other purposes. We're very much focused on enabling the discovery and access to Oxford's collections for a global audience. So this isn't just about Oxford or just about our institution. The kind of materials that we um, hold is our collective cultural heritage and therefore a global audience is very, very important. And the audience for Digital Bodley and 80% of our users are from outside the UK. So we're very much catering to um, an international audience. And I mentioned earlier that, that digitization has a big role to play in the preservation of physical items. So by creating digital surrogates of material, we uh, are then able to restrict uh, access to some of the more fragile um, uh, items in our collections that we wouldn't want people to be coming in and flicking through in the reading room, we can point them to uh, their digital surrogate. And for most of that uh, research, those surrogates are enough. Um, first of all, the Shakespeare's first folio, for example, we very much restrict access to that. For most scholars, being able to look at it online is enough. They don't need to physically hold that item. We work in partnership with other GLAM units. So within the library, we're part of the GLAM division of the university, which is gardens, libraries and museums. Um, and the libraries work 
with other units within the, uh, the division, such as the Ashmolean Museum, to think about um, all of our collections as cultural heritage and how we can move forward on, on digital initiatives around that. And we preserve the digital content, as I mentioned earlier, held by the libraries for the long term. So we're all about maintaining that content um, and having sort of good stewardship of it in the longer term. Next slide, please. So what sort of roles do we have in the digital library? Um, and I, I framed this in this way because I find myself saying this a lot. It's sort of a, a confession I often have to. I'm not actually a librarian. I have no library qualification. And so I quite often have to say this when I'm explaining what I do. And many of my colleagues in the digital library do the same because many of us don't have a library qualification. Um, some of us do, but it's not a requirement for the vast majority of roles that are in our digital library. And I would imagine that's true of digital libraries elsewhere. So this is a range of the kind of roles that we offer in, in the digital library. So digital project manager, senior systems architect, software engineer, um, digitization assistant, uh, digital preservation specialist, and so on. Um, most of those roles aren't don't require a library qualification. So my background is not in libraries as such. Um, so I was a, uh, studied English uh, undergraduate level, came to Oxford to do a master's in medieval literature, uh, and then I went to work as an editor, a dictionary editor for Oxford University Press for a few years before I joined the library as a digital editor working on a big text encoding project. Um, I did that for a few years, then I got into project management and I've ended up in, in the sort of more senior management role that I'm in now. So while having a library qualification is of course very useful um, within a digital library environment, it's not essential. Um, and there are many roles um, that uh, require different skills. So if we could move to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what those skills might be. So some of these will be familiar from, from Emma's um, slides on what sort of general skills we look for in a library. Those aren't hugely different when you get to the to, uh, digital library. We usually require an undergraduate degree. Um, most roles don't require a specific qualification in library management or, or library studies. Um, what you do need to have is a general interest in cultural heritage, libraries, knowledge and the support of teaching and learning. You need to be a good team player. We work very much in collaboration. Digital libraries are very collaborative environments, so you need to be able to work well with people, but also to crack on with work independently. You need to be a good communicator. As you might expect, you need to be uh, very IT proficient, so you might not have all of the um, technical skills uh, right at the beginning of a role in digital libraries, but you need to have a willingness and an aptitude and an enjoyment really of learning new skills, using new technologies, using new, um, uh, new software packages and so on. Um, I wouldn't say I'm not particularly technical. So it's not that all roles within a digital library require, require a huge amount of, of technical skills. A lot of them do, um, but you need to be more about you want to be the kind of person who likes to play around with things, who likes to, to learn how to do new things and to solve problems and to find new approaches to things. If you like your role to be exactly the same forever, digital libraries are not going to be for you because they evolve as you would expect as the technologies evolve. Um, next slide, please, Abby. Some roles will have much more specialist requirements. So as you might expect, software engineering roles require um, application development experience, you know, using specific technologies, especially for us at the moment, Python. We're a, a Python shop rather than a PHP uh, development team. We, you might have experience in software solution design and so on. You may have an understanding of or need an understanding of some library metadata formats and that's where a library qualification may come in handy but you can also get that information and that understanding that experience from other routes so digital humanities is quite often um, the background of people who end up working in digital libraries that same kind of combination of interest in humanities or in uh, in scholarship generally in knowledge and knowledge management combined with a sort of technical uh, bent for technical roles. We also have a, a number of management and administrative roles and that's much more uh, the kind of general experience that you would expect 
um, in that kind of role in any organisation. So good project or task or people management experience, experience working with financial information and tools, experience working across a portfolio of initiatives. So that kind of general skill set is of, of great value in digital libraries as it is elsewhere in, in libraries uh, generally. Next slide, please, Abby. So why work in digital libraries? So this is sort of my pitch for why it's a good thing to do and why I enjoy it. Um, so the things that I love about my job are lovely colleagues. So the, the people that I work with are wonderful, keen and interested people. And I work with people across the libraries. It's a very varied role. The work itself I find very interesting, and that's partly because of the variety, which as I put here is a challenge and a joy. So I, I just jotted down look back at my calendar just for last week. It's hard to remember sometimes uh, what I've been doing, but I just looked at last week the different sorts of things that I've had to think about and be planning for. Um, so last week I had to think about and plan for 18th century letters, 19th century diaries, maps, Sanskrit manuscripts, Tibetan manuscripts, digital exhibitions and Chinese collections, 19th century photographs, and a discovery interface that we're developing that will go across all manuscripts and archival collections that we hold. So that kind of variety is what I really love about my job because there's so no two days are the same. Everything is, is very different and, and therefore you know, maintains that interest. The challenge is that in digital libraries, we can't develop individual systems, individual approaches for all of those different things. So we're trying to standardise and make sustainable systems that can accommodate lots of different types of content. So that's what makes it quite challenging uh, in a good way and why sort of problem solving uh, and sort of having that kind of mental approach to work is something that's such a strength for people working in digital libraries. As you might expect, digital is a huge strategic focus across the organisation, across the sector, and therefore there's going to be a huge amount of continuing work in digital libraries. This is going to be a growth area um, and this is something that is not going away. We're going to have to be able to, to accommodate this, but also it evolves at quite a rate. And so there's always going to be new things emerging and you know there's always lots going on. And if you like that kind of work, you like to have a lot of different things going on, you like to explore lots of different avenues, then digital libraries could be for you. Um, so I hope that's given you a taste uh, of why working in digital libraries is, is fun and challenging and an interesting area. Um, and I'm happy to, to field any questions later that you might have about digital libraries specifically. So I'll, I'll hand back to uh, hopefully Jasdeep now can join. Yes. Thank you, Judith. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Great. Um, I was going to talk about, you know, some of the skills that are required, including tech and IT, which I thought I was pretty good at, but obviously my laptop decided to um, install Windows, re <laughs> restart when it wanted. So uh, the unknowns are always there. Um, OK, hello, everybody. My name is Jasteep. I uh, will talk to you briefly about um, EDI work at the Bodleian Libraries, uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. I'll talk about one particular project, um, although there are many different strands of uh, EDI work that are being undertaken at the Bodleian. Um, the project I'll talk about is the project I manage, uh, which is my role as project manager for this project. We are our history towards racial equity. This particular project looks at EDI through the lens of race and ethnicity in particular. And in the context of the Bodleian Libraries and its collection looks at empire history um, on the wider sort of um, scale of things. Uh, next slide, slide please, Abby. Thank you. Um, so just. Ooh, uh, yeah, so just um, to start off with just an overview of the project I'll go on to um, duties and skills in a second but uh, uh, the project's been funded externally by the Mellon Foundation it is designed to look at the imbalances in the collection and staffing through the lens of race and legacies of empire uh, as you can imagine the Bodleian has collected for a long period of time and as it's collected there have been some biases along the way there have been some incomplete sort of um, 
uh, cataloging uh, along along the way, and and also society has shifted um, during that period. The project is driven by the guiding principles of the Bodleian Libraries, which is to foster and value inclusion and diversity in everything we do, and it's divided up into eight work streams through three different uh, focus areas, and they they look at policies, advancing policies, strategies and approaches towards um, issues relating to race and ethnicity. And in that, those three themes are collections, audiences and staffing. I'll go on to some of the work streams. So I'll speak a little bit about the project and then a little bit about my work, which isn't it isn't business as usual, but it informs business as usual. Um, next slide, please. The project takes its name from uh, this quote by American writer James Baldwin. History is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. Um, the, the, the project looks at the collection the Bodleian holds, looks at the past. We are part of that. We, are, we all are part of that. But um, the current day is made up of everything that has happened in the past and so we can learn a lot from that so we take we take inspiration from james baldwin here but also um to try to engage wider audiences so so students of course academics communities and um uh just the public on on a wider sort of scale next slide please this is just a quick um sort of overview of the structure of the project so you get a bit of an idea of sort of things that I uh, I do with this project and, and also understand that this is not a sole um, it's not a solitary role it's a role that's as you can see with the project manager right in, in the heart of everything that's going on uh, the governance of the project is 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 uh, done by uh, it's governed by an external advisory board made up of the project core team and external advisors from various different universities and organizations in related areas. Um, below that, we have the immediate projects team, uh, which is about 10 uh, or so colleagues. Um, and as I mentioned, the project is divided into these three uh, themes, but uh, or three sort of uh, yeah, themes, but into these eight work streams. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about those uh, and and go into some of my roles. But Bodleian Empire allows the the Bodleian to look inwards at its collecting history, its relationship with empire over time, and how it wants to kind of proceed um, with uh, this subject on the wider sort of level. So it's a lot of um, looking at the collections, looking at the institutional archives. We've just recruited a research associate to join the project to undertake some research for this. Collection description looks at the way that we describe catalogues. Um, Emma mentioned this earlier, the way that we describe the collections in the catalogues. Sometimes that terminology is dated and as we progress in society, some of those terminologies get updated. You can never future proof, but is there a way that we can refresh this so that it creates an inclusive uh, environment and and um, a welcoming space for people accessing the collections. And that might be quite simple. It might just be, you know, um, the changing of uh, certain words or um, the renaming certain departments. So we've just renamed the Oriental Institute um, and, 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 you know, the word Oriental was being used for a long period of time, but it certainly doesn't uh, encapsulate the fact that it's got uh, Asia in there, and Southeast Asia, and, and you know the Middle East, and what does Middle East? So there's lots of questions that it asks. Um, developing the collection is next. So how do we um, identify gaps in the collection and then plug those gaps and then try to diversify the way that we uh, increase um, some of that collection and 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 improve that collection? Uh, Judith spoke. Uh, about digitization, she's leading the digitization strand. Uh, how do we diversify the collections that are 
uh, put up on digital bodily and how do we conduct further research to identify sort of trends and patterns going on. Um, and then audiences are a, are a key aspect of this project. So um, public engagement, exhibitions, schools, community engagement, communications is the next strand where we um, look at how we communicate relating to subjects like this, uh, subjects relating to uh, race and ethnicity, empire, colonial history. And then finally, the, the, the last two work streams are relating to the staff at the Bodleian. Uh, organizational culture looks at how um, the environment is for the staff. How do they feel? How do they, ex what sort of barriers do they uh, experience? Um, in the body and then what can be done to improve that? What sort of training can we um, um, in, introduce there? And then staffing is how diverse is the staff at the body and how do we work towards um, improving that and how do we measure that um, so that it's a space that's welcoming for everybody and, and equal for everybody. Next slide, please. Um, this is the actual duties and skills slide. The other one was supposed to say introduction. Um, here, it's it's a little bit um, unique, my role. As I mentioned, I, I project managed this project, but I am here, there and everywhere. So I'm not, you know, there isn't a business as usual. There is, I've listed some project management skills uh, that are useful for this. I have over 10 years of experience in project management, as well as um, as a historian in, and curator in uh, empire and colonial history. That helps me in terms of context, but in terms of EDI work or work relating to this particular sort of area, uh, I think, you know, history, um, of course, is going to help. But these basic sort of project management skills that are skills that you can develop across lots of different um, areas are certainly going to be useful. Um, I will say, though, that some of the things that you can develop through a role like this, uh, certainly the, the bottom uh, section of leadership. So leading a massive team. This is not me delivering this project. Uh, and many organizations do that. They bring someone in and say, OK, you know, you deliver the EDI or you deliver the, the diversity strand of things. I'm not delivering here. I'm, I'm coordinating the wider project, but the colleagues um, across the board are delivering. So this allows me to develop some leadership skills. Um, some communication skills are really important here. You develop those, but to, to have some um, of those sort of skills really, really helps you um, kick start and, and uh, move the project along. Organizational skills are so valuable for project management uh, in, in all aspects. And of course, you know, there, there are colleagues across the board. So there are colleagues that work that are heads of departments. There are um, directors and then and and you know senior management so the confidence to be able to speak at all different levels is a really really important skill here that you will gain but also um, you will um, uh, you will benefit from having um, next slide please Not sure if it's frozen. Uh, here we are. Great. So just the last few slides here. Um, as Judith mentioned, you know, some of the things that I enjoy about this role are uh, going to be different to some of the others. Some will be the same. So, you know, second, there is uh, a dynamic team. It's you. There are so many different colleagues with so many different skills and you get to learn a lot from them. So you're constantly learning. But one of the things what I put right at the start or right at the top here is an opportunity to make a positive change in the heart of Oxford. I say the heart of Oxford because I feel the Bodleian Library is the heart of Oxford University and Oxford University is the heart of Oxford. So it's a real unique space um, that uh, that this project has and, and as a result that I have um, in managing this project. But there are, you know, there are ways to initiate new perspectives and new sort of um, new initiatives really. So, you know, we've introduced co-curation, we've introduced um, uh, deep diving into collections that might have been dormant for a long period of time. But most importantly, no two days are the same. Um, 
I'll be, as Judith mentioned, you know, very similar. I, I'll be looking at digitization one day, writing captions another day, some media work another day, and it's very, very varied. And that's quite exciting. That's really, really valuable. But it also, for somebody that wants to kind of uh, hop around from a project management perspective, you can learn a lot about the wider organization very quickly. From an EDI perspective, it's very enriching and very valuable. Um, to know that you're making that difference. I'll end with a case study. Um, next slide, please. Um, currently, we have this exhibition on display at the, the Western Library. This is co-curated with the Museum of Colour. It's called These Things Matter. And the, the exhibition came out from uh, some workshops with artists uh, from this organization that we partnered with to create responses relating to uh, uh, slavery in and, and racism in the collection. And it's, a, it's something that Bodleian might not have done before. It's quite daring. It's quite uh, difficult conversations a lot of the time, but uh, the work is there, you know, that 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 start has been made um, and and that conversation has been started, regardless of how difficult sometimes that may be. And actually it, it needn't be. But 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 the work that we've done, the project, the shape of the project allows us to really um, take conversations like this forward. Um, and then just my last slide is a is a picture from the launch of These Things Matter. Um, as I mentioned, my my role isn't business as usual. It's it's got lots of things. It's got project management. It's got EDI work. It's got history and and um, academic work there as well. So it's very very um, diverse and varied in its uh, in its composition anyway. But it shows how many different opportunities and avenues there are to kind of explore with a with a role like this. But that's to say, you know, there there might not necessarily be this particular role in libraries, but it shows how many different things you could be involved with. Uh, if you looked at project management or you looked at EDI. I'll stop there, mindful of time, um, and I'll pass over to, I think, Oliver next. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, so my name is Oliver House, uh, and the aim of my talk here today is to introduce you to the nature of the provision of reader services within the Western Library. I'll do this by giving some details about the Western itself, our reading room operations and our team. Uh, I work in Western Library Reader Services. This is a section within the Department of Special Collections uh, at the Bodleian. Specifically, my current role is Superintendent of the Special Collections Reading Rooms in the Western Library. This basically means that I manage the reader spaces in the West. The Western Library itself is one of the three buildings which make up the central Bodleian site along with the old Bodleian Library and the Radcliffe Camera, and is home to the Bodleian Special Collections. Of the 13 million items held by the Bodleian Libraries, over 1 million can be categorised as Special Collections. Our Special Collections comprise manuscripts and archives, rare books, printed ephemera, maps and music. All these Special Collections are consulted by readers in the three reading rooms over two floors in the Western. Although we aren't overly prescriptive about what can be seen where, the general breakdown is as follows. The Sir Charles McCarris reading room on level one is primarily for our music collections. The rare books and manuscripts reading room also on level one for archives, including Oxford University archives, Western manuscripts, rare books and printed ephemera and maps. The David reading room on level five is for Asian and Middle Eastern manuscripts and books, archive collections relating to the history of the Commonwealth and Africa and Oxford Humanities theses. In addition to these reading rooms, the Western Library has exhibition spaces, spaces a lecture theatre, seminar spaces used for outreach and education purposes, a shop and a public cafe. There are more than 40 kilo kilometres, 24 miles of storage in the Western. These comprise special collections of materials held in closed access book stack compartments over three floors below ground and open access modern printed books and journals in the reading rooms, reference areas in the Western Gallery. This is in addition to the off-site storage coll off -site collection storage facility near Swindon in Wiltshire, which houses over 8 million items, including many special collections materials. Materials are requested for consultation in the reading rooms from both on-site and off-site storage locations. 
Our capacity for level one, both reading rooms, is 82 reader spaces. The maximum occupancy for the David reading room on level five is 44. In addition to these 126 reader desks, we have five digital microform scanners, around 10 reader PCs and quick lookup machines, and three height adjustable desks. We also have large tables for oversized items and maps, and close invigilation desks for select or reserved items. Our opening hours are 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays. Our opening hours are the same throughout Oxford term and vacation. During the week, we have a twice daily delivery from our site storage facility and regular deliveries from the on site book stacks throughout the day with a last fetch at the hall to four in the afternoon. Saturdays are staffed by a separate team of four Saturday duty officers and five library assistants. These teams work alternate Saturdays on a rota basis. Evening duties and weekday and Saturday backup are provided by curatorial and support staff from throughout the Department of Special Collections. My fellow superintendent and I have responsibility for managing the reader services operations in the Western on a day to day basis. Evening These primarily include activities associated with the reading rooms and our mediated copying service for special collections. We manage a team of five library assistants and one mediated copying officer. Overall, our library assistant's duties are to process the delivery of collections materials to the reading room reserves, issue materials to readers and return materials to storage locations, deal with reading room bookings and pre-orders by email, and answer general inquiries relating to the reading rooms. Each library assistant also undertakes some extra duties such as processing new books for the, dis for the open shelves or display, assisting in staffing the Bodleian's live chat service, or processing requests for our mediated copying service for special collections. My own core duties and to invigilate and manage the reading rooms, deal with any problems or difficulties associated with accessing or locate, locating collections material, advise readers on specific conditions of access, direct and supervise the work of the team of library assistants, answer special collections reference inquiries both by email and in person in the reading rooms. Liaise with curatorial colleagues within special collections and other staff across the, li the Bodleian libraries and manage the reading rooms rota. As much as all of this might sound rather dry, my work keeps me very busy. Although libraries are quiet, calm spaces suitable for scholarly research, ensuring that readers have their materials delivered to their desks on time and in a managed space takes a considerable amount of work behind the scenes and is often a collaborative effort involving staff from across our department and beyond. Because of the significance of our collections, we welcome readers from across the globe, not just students and staff of the University of Oxford. We have many external readers, students, academics and independent researchers who regularly visit us to consult our special collections. We're usually very busy in the summer months when academics from overseas visit to conduct their research when they're not teaching. Such visits are often planned well in advance and require our skills and expertise to ensure that readers have identified the collections they need to consult and that they can be made available for the duration of their stay. In this way, my work is very, very varied. I meet and correspond with people from all over the world and help them access our collections either in person in the reading rooms or remotely through our mediated copying service. I regularly conduct inductions and tours of the Western reader spaces for new Oxford postgraduate students, our in visiting fellows and guests and other visitors. The body is a large and complex organisation my work involves building up and maintaining networks within the Bodleian libraries across Oxford, the UK and overseas. As much as my role demands a knowledge of our collections, catalogues and finding aids and the logistical processes involved in accessing and retrieving those materials and the various conditions of access in place on specific collections, it's primarily about interactions with people. Meeting and working with people from around the world, both staff and readers, is stimulating, enjoyable and rewarding. I particularly enjoy answering reference inquiries and being part of the research and publication process. It's fun building up a regular correspondence with people, often helping readers manage specific projects or seeing them develop their careers from both graduate students through to academics and published authors. In addition to these duties, I also act as the Disability Liaison Librarian for the Western Library and sit on the Bodleian Library's Disability Committee. I regularly meet readers with disabilities in order to help them access our collections and conduct personal emergency evacuation plans with those readers who may need extra assistance in the event of an emergency evacuation of the building. In conjunction with the head of Western Library Reader Services and my fellow superintendent, 
and other managers within our section, I helped to develop and implement new policies and procedures relating to our activities. Examples of these include the launch of our mediated copying service for special collections during lockdown in 2020. Since we went live with this service in July of that year, we've provided over 431,000 scanned images of bodily and special collections materials to registered and unregistered readers across the world for private research use. By far the majority of those have been provided to external readers, around about 84%. Similarly, in April of last year, we launched an automated request system for archives and manuscripts stored on site. Both myself and my fellow superintendent were very much involved in the planning, development and implementation of this new system. And that's the end of my talk. Um, can I have the, the, the last slide, the beginning slide, uh, the, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Antti Minstunadula and I'm the head of East Asia section of the Bodleian Libraries. My role involves managing a team of staff to run two specialist libraries, namely the Chinese and Japanese libraries, and I oversee the development of resources, and the services of these uh, subject areas and also I do some research uh, in special collections and disseminate information about them. Today I'm going to tell you the story of how Chinese books and the intellectual exchanges between China and England started in the 17th century. Through the story I attempt to illustrate the long history of cultural and linguistic exchanges an understanding of China in England, uh, widely in Europe, and diverse voices that are represented in our collections. Chinese books have been part of the Bodleian Library's collections since the Library's foundation in 1604. Sorry, Abid, can we have the next slide? Just run through a little bit more. <laughs> I forgot to ask. The next one, please. Yes, thank you. The first known acquisition of a Chinese book dates from 1604. Our founder, Sir Thomas Bodley, was instrumental in starting this collection, even though he did not speak or read or understand Chinese. His handwriting appears in the 1604 book, as you can see from the image, but he was holding the book upside down um, that book is, you can see it on the left hand side, the Chinese upside down. Clearly, Sir Thomas did not read or understand Chinese, and nobody in England did at that time, but he still bought Chinese books. The collection grew over the following four centuries, and it continues to grow today. It's now one of the most significant Chinese rare book and manuscript collections in the world outside China containing the largest number of Chinese books that arrived in Europe in the 17th century. The books, interestingly, as the number of books and manuscripts grew, the interest and urgency to understand them also grew. In 1687, after 83 years being on the shelves, first Chinese book arrived, the first Chinese visitor to British Isle. Next slide, sorry. Um, <laughs> the first recorded Chinese visitor to the British Isles arrived in Oxford to despair and explain the Chinese books that were held in Bodleian. The Chinese visitor Shen Puzong and Thomas Hyde, the fifth Bodleian librarian, worked together to understand the books as well as each other over Shen's seven week stay in Oxford. They also developed deep uh, personal friendship and also uh, uh, a very uh, uh, deep uh, respect for each other. And they talked about exchange information about geography, philosophy, language, as well as talked about usual subjects um, such as wine, food, chess and relationships. 
Yeah, I quote one of the description of Shen by Thomas Hyde, which shows how deeply he was influenced by Shen and very high respect for his Chinese visitor. Next slide, please, Abby. Next slide, please, Abby. And also quote here a, a letter that Shen has written to Thomas Hyde um, um, describing uh, a, a, his impression of, of Thomas Hyde. And this may also, it seems obviously, the exchange between Shen and Hyde predates the colonial era and gives us a food, gives us food for thought about how it might have been like without colonialism. Next slide, please. Not only Bodleian Library's collections are diverse, the Chinese collections in itself in Bodleian also diverse. What you're seeing here is an illustrated album depicting the people of China's southwestern borders in the early 19th century. This shows that China, Chinese people themselves are, are diverse, at least sometimes we forget to remember. Next slide, please, Abby. Sorry, I keep forgetting this. And you can see this is my favorite on the left hand side that it's a, a female official in southwest China. And uh, she is on a horse, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the man is carrying her luggage, and somebody is carrying uh, an umbrella so, to, so that she doesn't uh, uh, get burned um, in, in the sun. It's very interesting to see uh, what happened in, in these areas in terms of customs and, and gender relationships. Next slide, please. Geographic knowledge represents one of the focus of the earliest Bodleian Chinese collections. This map, which came to the Bodleian in 1659, demonstrates the remarkable accuracy of geographic patterns, sophisticated mapping techniques, and sea navigation routes, which are unique in the world. Next slide, please. The ancient books can also be used for modern purposes. This sea navigation manual, which came to Bodleian in 1634, is the oldest writing that referred to a rock island. Hotly now hotly disputed between China and Japan. Next slide, please. And health and well-being was one of the focus of the books arrived in Europe in 17th century. This pair of acupuncture charts from 17th century is essential for Chinese medicine, and it remains more or less unchanged today. Next slide, please. This is another example of uh, someone holding the Chinese book upside down because they didn't know. Next slide, please. China has great literary tradition. These are the cover images of the great Chinese fantasy novel, Journey to the West, or known as Monkey King from 16th century. Next slide, please. It's the only surviving copy of this edition, which was originally intended for general public consumption and written in colloquial language. Next slide, please. We also hold some artworks, and this one we have just uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the slide is first is a depiction of uh, Dragon Boat Festival from uh, 17th century, and second is a painting of peonies by a very well-known 17th century artist. Next slide, please. Now, next question is how we engage, how, we, how these collections are used. In 2022, we have started a project to engage with local Chinese community. We have held a large event in June for the Dragon Boat Festival in Western Library, which is attended by over 200 people. Next slide, please. Here are the members of public learning to write their names in Chinese characters using calligraphics, Chinese brush. Next slide, please. We have displayed selected treasures of Bodleian, which are known to the most members of the public. Next slide, please.
And we had a drawing workshop for children inspired by the Bodleian copy of the Journey to the West, the Monkey King story. Next slide, please. Children learned about the story of the Monkey King and the book held in the Bodleian through the drawing workshop. Next slide, please. They drew the Monkey King against the backdrop of Oxford, the Red Camp to be more precise. Next slide, please. This is a, a six-year-old. Um, <laughs> that's it. The, 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 the girl. Um, she is. That's a, 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 a drawing. Next slide, please. So we had some good feedback and uh, very positive um, from parents and also the community members about these two workshops. And I just leave, leave you to read that through. And I just want to tell you uh, just very briefly about what we plan to do next. Um, we're going to uh, uh, hope to enhance the, the engagement activity with, we already started with the communities and reaching out to underrepresented communities who didn't know. One of the biggest thing that uh, that shocked me is that they didn't know we, we had any all these things at all. There's a lot of them. And also there is lots of enthusiasm and also uh, they were astonished to find them. And we're also trying to do online exhibition with community participation and the, my colleagues in the, the education and public engagement team is, is considering uh, to look at uh, how we can develop school visits and programs. Thank you. Thank you, I take questions. Um, hello everyone, um, great. So that is the end of the session. Thank you ever so much to Justy, Judith, Mamti and Oliver for talking to us about their roles. Um, before you all go, it would be really helpful um, for us if uh, if you could fill in a mentee poll. This is completely optional. Um, as already discussed, as a profession and in the Bodleian Libraries, we want to encourage a more diverse range of people to come and work with us. Um, so it'd be really helpful for us to see uh, the sort of the audience today and, and whether we've reached a diverse audience uh, with this session. To fill in the poll, you can just do it from your mobile phone, menti.com. You can use that code, the number on the slide there to fill it in. If you could just complete that for us, as I said, it's optional. Um, that would be really, really helpful. And um, we will just send a very short evaluation um, after this event, which would be grateful if you could fill in for us. Um, otherwise, um, it's been great to talk to you all today. Thanks ever so much to my colleagues for their talks. Thank you to um, Abby and Ellie for looking after the slides and thank you to Natasha as well for um, looking after the questions, the Q&A today. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, you can always email us at staffdev, which is where you made your booking. And um, yeah, um, we hope that that's been, been enjoyable and, and informative for you. But thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.